Thank you, Scott, for accepting our invitation. Uh, Scott Trackberg is Professor of Digital Culture in the Department of Linguistic, Literary and Aesthetic Studies at the University of Bergen in Norway. And his latest book, uh, it's called Electronic Literature, and it was published at the end of uh, 2018 or early? Like December in the UK, January in the US. Okay, so it's uh, almost uh, 2019. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a really wonderful work that brings together uh, 20 years of uh, research and practice-based research uh, and offers a really wide entry into the field of electronic literature for those who are not familiar with the field and also places electronic literature in the wider uh, history of experimental uh, literature. Uh, I think I should also highlight the fact that Scott uh, uh, is uh, an experimental uh, artist. So he has been doing uh, many uh, kinds of works with, new, uh, with, with digital media and experimenting with uh, uh, software uh, and in general with the, what we can describe as the uh, properties or features of uh, the media, uh, computational media, and I would highlight uh, works that uh, um, we, could, we could describe them as uh, fictional or written works, uh, like, uh, uh, for instance, uh, email novel or email uh, uh, experiments in, in, in narrative in, in, in narrative using email. But I think the most uh, significant work is expressed in a series of film uh, poems, uh, experimental films that he has made with uh, Roderick Coover. Uh, in many, many of these films you see what we can do when we use uh, combinatory uh, processes that are possible uh, thanks to digital uh, media. Uh, these uh, films apply many techniques that we recognize from, uh, for instance, constraint-based uh, literary art, uh, the kind of art that was practiced by Ulipo uh, and other groups. So, uh, there, are, there are several projects. I would highlight two uh, of my favorites, uh, and I just learned about a, re a recent one that I've not uh, seen yet. Toxicity. Uh, a reflection about uh, our uh, situation in the post climate change world and also Arts and Minds, the, the interrogations project. Uh, this one is based on um, ex exploring uh, descriptions of um, soldiers uh, who went to fight the war in Iraq and it's set up as a virtual uh, reality uh, combinatory uh, interactive uh, experience. So his work has been exhibited in many places and is uh, also a, rec a recognized author within the community of electronic literature as well, as I said, scholar and artist. So he won, uh, I think, the Hoover Award for the Arts and Minds project, uh, which is a major uh, literary art award in 2016, 2016. And this year, 2019, he won the uh, Anne Catherine Hales Award for this book, Electronic Literature. So, thank you, uh, Scott, for being here. Uh, and we are looking forward to listening to Thanks so much, Manu. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to turn on my timer here because um, thank you for the, uh, for the invitation uh, to come here and, and talk to you for this, what I think is really an important uh, conference. I actually had I submitted an abstract uh, as soon as I saw the call um, because uh, I think this is such an important uh, topic because um, we have many gatherings about electronic literature. Uh, but there haven't been many yet focused specifically on teaching electronic literature. 
So it's been, uh, it's been great the last couple of days to hear from people who are actually sort of in the trenches trying this out um, with students in a bunch of different uh, contexts, and I hope it will continue. Um, so my talk is pretty unscripted. I, what I have is a pile of, of slides, so I might, uh, I'm going to keep an eye on my time. We might not uh, get through everything, um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Mainly what I want to talk to you about today is my recently published book, um, Electronic Literature. And this comes out of teaching electronic literature for 20 years and really not having a text. Um, so what I really wanted to do was to put together a book that would look at the histories and genres of electronic literature and rather than focusing narrowly in on one or on one specific phenomena to try to address as much of the field as possible in a way that would invite people who were sort of unfamiliar with electronic literature into it and also a book that just selfishly that I could use in the courses uh, that I teach to introduce my students to it. Uh, as Manuel said, I just put this slide in uh, earlier this week just because I was very excited uh, last week to win the, uh, the N. Catherine Hales Award, uh, which means a lot to me. N. Catherine Hales is um, uh, one of the most uh, renowned uh, scholars in the field and she's been a great uh, influence on my career. I edited the first electronic literature uh, collection with her. And her book 10 years ago was titled uh, Electronic Literature, New Horizons for the Literary. And this was the first, uh, in some ways, one of the first books to kind of try to bridge the gap between traditional literary studies and uh, electronic literature. Uh, so when I titled my book Electronic Literature with no uh, New Horizon, uh, people were at first a little, isn't that Kate's title? Um, and I said, well, yes, but what we really want to do is look at electronic literature not as a new horizon, but 10 years on, a decade on, when we're looking at a, a really a rather large corpus of work, a, a large body of work, an international uh, field of practice. So uh, even though I was initially opposed to the idea of the man on the moon that my publishers pushed for the cover, uh, once I thought about Hale's uh, uh, New Horizons for the Literary, it seemed appropriate to, uh, to place uh, an astronaut on the moon, as it were, sort of beyond those new horizons into the present. Um, so during this talk, I, I'm hoping to do three things. Uh, by the way, the PowerPoint now suggests uh, layouts for your slides. So some of these are, are AI-generated uh, <laughs> professional-looking slides. I want to provide you with an overview of my book. I want to share some of my experiences teaching electronic literature in different contexts, really. And I want to offer up some ideas of how electronic literature can be taught in different contexts. So literary studies, uh, creative writing uh, as a, a sort of critical approach to digital culture, uh, and as a digital humanities discipline. OK, so I, I start out the book uh, by asking people to uh, imagine a book. Imagine a book uh, as a technology. And think about the properties of the book, uh, that the book's a technology that took a long time to develop. There's these different, uh, these different aspects of a technological apparatus to it uh, that took a lot of thinking uh, to develop the, the Codex book. Um, and so appreciate that every time we're opening a book, we're looking uh, at a reading technology, right? And then to imagine that the book were different. Imagine it offered other affordances and material properties. Imagine that instead of turning pages, you could make any word in the book a link to some other part of the book or even to some other book. Imagine it were bound on a spool so that you could enter and exit anywhere, a book without beginning or end. Imagine what you would do with that as a storyteller. Imagine what it would mean if every time you put the book up on the shelf, the words on the book shifted and rearranged themselves. Would it be the same book? What would you do with that as a poet? Imagine if when you pulled the book down from the shelf and opened up the first page, the book asked you in what direction you wanted to go and would not begin to tell a story until you responded. Imagine if the book were a conversation, a novel that you had to talk to. Imagine that as you read a poem on the page of the book, the words jumped off the page into three-dimensional space and began flying around the room, shifting form and regrouping in the physical environment. Imagine that when you opened the book, it was filled with threads, connecting it to all the other books in your library, which would make it possible to pull part of another book right into the text of the one you were reading. 
Imagine if the book could read the newspaper and change its content depending on the time of the day or the weather or the season. Imagine if you opened the book and found all of those of your friends who are reading the book at the same time, leaving their comments in the margins. Imagine that when you opened the book, those same friends were all writing the book simultaneously. Imagine the book is a network, always on, always connected, and always changing. Imagine what you could do as a reader. Imagine what you could do as a writer. Imagine the book as a network computer. So the main approach that I'm taking in the book uh, is uh, somewhat controversial in that it's somewhat traditional. I'm, I'm looking at this and thinking about genre. Um, now, why genre? So uh, some people say, well, that's not cutting edge. That's not new. This goes back to ideas of formalism and, and structuralism that st stretch back at least a century. But this comes out of my experience teaching, that it makes logical sense to say, all right, when we look at this group of objects together, what are their commonalities? It gives us a basis for comparing things to each other and a basis for sort of understanding and moving past the interface. So when I think about genre, though, in electronic literature, you're always going to have what you might say threads of practice rather than traditional genres. And you're going to have oftentimes many different threads of practice within the same work. Also, when we think about genre, we're going to be thinking both about literary genre and about technological genre, which is sort of a different thing in that the technological material properties of the form shape its poetics uh, in a different way. The other thing that I encourage people to think about throughout this book is the cultural context in which both the technology and the work is produced, right? Um, I, I should have, sorry. Uh, so uh, traditionally people have talked about electronic literature as avant-garde. This was kind of the, the cutting edge hypertext 1990s vision, reinventing uh, the word. Uh, and instead, I encourage people in a way to think, okay, yes, this is responding to the avant-garde. And when we look at these genres, we're going to see the marks of history of the avant-garde. But you might say, in a way, we're looking at a garde derriere, uh, to quote my friend Talon Mehmet, um, in, in the sense that the authors who are working in these genres are kind of taking some practices from experimental literature and art of the 20th century and then adapting them into a new technological context and doing different things with them. But many of these ideas and other writers, Manuel Portela is, is a notable one, have, have, have commented on this and I think uh, a lot of the Portuguese scholars have, have also noted this, that there is a connecting thread between experimental literature uh, from the 20th century and the things that people are doing now with the computer. And that connecting thread might also make it a bit easier for us to understand these things. So the other reason why I'm sort of emphasizing on this approach is that if you don't know your history, and if you say we're inventing something new completely every time, you're just in reinventing the wheel unnecessarily. So if you know your history, then you know where you're coming from. And there's kind of two traditional approaches to literary studies. One is to say, let's focus on the rupture. Let's focus on how this breaks uh, with tradition. The other approach is to focus on continuity and to say, uh, how are we understanding these things passing together in time and responding to each other? And that's maybe more of the thread that I'm focusing on because I believe that uh, while rupture is exciting, continuity is the basis for building a field. So this book really is, uh, is a toolbox um, it's meant to be used, uh, it's meant to be applied in the classroom, and it's meant to, in some ways, help people get over some of their, their hang-ups about where these things are coming from. Um, also, uh, their pretensions that they're, uh, that they're reinventing the future that's already passed. Uh, I focus on what I think are five uh, essential genres uh, in, in five of the main chapters. One is combinatory poetics. This is the oldest sort of thread of uh, computational literature, uh, arguably stretching back to the, at least the 1950s. Uh, hypertext fiction is the first one that sort of gained widespread uh, critical attention, uh, boomed and then maybe withered a bit um, in the early 2000s. Uh, interactive fiction, this is a form that stretches back to the earliest computer games. 
uh, that were made uh, textually, uh, where the, the player responded using text and has been a tradition that continued, uh, and then other forms that use game vernaculars now. Kinetic and interactive poetry, this is something where we have in Portugal certainly a long uh, tradition that stretches back to, to visual poetry, concrete poetry, uh, other forms of uh, visual poetry on the page. Uh, and network writing, uh, writing practices that are specific to the network context. So I'm going to very quickly march through uh, the contents of the book just to give you a quick impression. I'm not going to highlight everything here. In the first, the first chapter, we look at these ideas of genre. Uh, we look at the, uh, the history of theoretical, critical, and analytical work in the field. Uh, to really establish a, a sense of the field, and we, and we discuss why would we want to go about uh, reading electronic literature to begin with. What are, what are the strengths uh, of this approach, and what are the things that we don't usually think about um, for students, in particular, that, that this offers us. Then we look at uh, combinatory poetics. So we start um, with the, the context, the artistic context, and the history. Uh, we look at the idea of pr procedural syntactic uh, generation systems. Um, we look at more contemporary, uh, because this really is a tradition that you can look at over the course of more than 50 years. Um, we look at th con contemporary things like uh, bots that generate text, uh, uh, not including those that uh, manipulate elections, but those that are um, specifically meant for poetry. Uh, and new forms of generative uh, poetry uh, like D David Javé Johnston's uh, Rewrites Project, which use neural nets um, to generate uh, poetry. Uh, hypertext fiction, which I think the reason why this attracted so much critical attention early on is that it really does kind of spring from modernism and postmodernism. Um, and in, in particular, I focus on the book on metafiction, uh, and, and the reflexivity, uh, something again Manuel looks at a lot, um, with the medium. Um, then we look at the sort of evolution of hypertext as a technology. It's obviously been a very important technology if you think about, um, and not, maybe not too many people think about this, but when you log into a web page, the first four letters you type are HTTP, and that stands for hypertext transfer protocol, right? And HTML is hypertext markup language. So hypertext, in addition to being a sort of uh, form that we can think of in literary context, is also sort of the basis of the World Wide Web and many computational systems. Uh, then we look at the sort of first generation hypertext, um, which were uh, pre-web. Um, there was a, a lot of work done before the web, and then as it moved on to the web, uh, interactive fiction, we start with the, the earliest text adventure games. And the interesting thing that happened was this was a booming industry for a short period of time. Uh, then uh, graphics cards came along, right? And uh, Space Invaders came along. And suddenly what was, uh, what was really a, a, a game form based on writing, uh, the industry dropped out. Really interesting thing happened, though, is that a lot of people love these things and miss these things, uh, developed their own platforms, developed their own language for, for writing adventure games, and this sort of amateur community took place and kept developing this form and then indeed developing it in much more interesting uh, literary ways. We look at some of the, the features of, of these types of games and some of the possibilities that they offer. And then this kind of interesting resurgence, recombination with hypertext that has happened uh, in the form of twine games. And then we look at some of the ways that artists are just using game platforms now uh, as literary platforms. Uh, kinetic poetry is again a form that's rooted in literary tradition. Uh, coming out of, uh, and we can, you know, again, uh, go back more than 100 years, uh, looking at concrete poetry, symbolism, futurism, letrism, visual poetry, uh, some of some sound poetry practices, even title sequences. This is something John Cayley's written about um, before we move into uh, early work in digital poetry. Of course, again, I would mention uh, Pedro Barbosa and other, uh, other Portuguese authors were, were very cutting edge in both combinatory and, uh, and, uh, and kinetic poetry very early on. 
Um, and then I, I spend some time just looking at how have particular technological platforms uh, shaped the ways, uh, the, the sort of poetics of kinetic and visual poetry over time, because that's an important interaction. Uh, and then sort of looking at how we balance movement and interactivity with meaning uh, in digital poetry. Uh, finally, some of the most uh, exciting forms particular to the network, writers have been saying, okay, we've developed all these new writing and communication technologies. Um, how are they changing the way that we write, but also how do they offer us new, uh, new forms for storytelling, uh, new forms for poetry? Um, so things like code work, which are sort of uh, assemblages of human and machine language. Uh, FLARF, which is uh, uh, poetry that's generated using search engines in different ways. Uh, early examples of fictions that were wrapped around uh, the conventions of home pages, uh, email novels, fictional blogs, uh, fictions that take place on Twitter, different kinds of online writing communities, different forms of collective narrative projects, uh, netprov or network-based improvisation. Uh, and then uh, something that I think is really uh, important right now is the idea of network critique. In other words, that because, uh, because electronic literature is, uh, includes reflective literary artifacts, in some ways it's the best form for us to look at and comprehend changes that are happening in the way that we think and communicate that, we might, that might be happening too fast, that probably are happening too fast, for us to stand back and process and think about. Um, and I think m many of the most interesting works of electronic literature are doing exactly just that. Uh, finally, the last chapter, um, to be honest with you, was because my publisher told me I could only have 200 pages and I was already about 20,000 words over. Uh, so this became an omnibus chapter um, where I look at a, a number of different forms that kind of combine different elements of the core genre. So, Locative narrative, these are narratives that are situated uh, in physical space and physical environments where you actually go to places and you get, a, a, get a, a section of a story or interact with a story in a physical environment. Uh, interactive textual installations, if you followed Roberto Simonowski's uh, talk uh, opening keynote, he discussed uh, some of these installations that use text uh, in, as a material arguably meaningfully or not meaningfully. Uh, and then some of the sort of work that I've been doing in recent years, uh, using some of the from, uh, uh, techniques from electronic literature uh, in cinema contexts. Um, and th there are examples, again, of these going back to the, to the 1960s, at least. Um, but thinking about how to expand the cinematic environment, um, how to place stories in things like uh, cave uh, 3D virtual reality theater uh, environments, or how to use combinatory poetics to create versions of films that I, I was showing one as you walked in that was recombining and writing sonnets um, that will be different every single time the film runs, um, uh, but sort of using some of those techniques. And then as we begin to think about how we use augmented reality for literature. A little bit about the uh, apparatus that we've developed in the field of electronic literature uh, that's been essential because when we started doing this, libraries didn't know what to do with these objects, right? And it's a big problem for us who teach it because a lot of these things last about five years uh, before they face technological obsolescence. So as a field, we've had to develop uh, an apparatus to to document and to archive and to uh, track and map this field uh, just so that we could be able to teach the material uh, that we saw 10 years ago uh, to students who are just beginning to encounter it today. Um, and you know, again, I'd mentioned one of the most important databases is, uh, is here, uh, Rui Torres and uh, Manuel both work on the, the POEX archive, which links experimental Portuguese poetry and uh, Portuguese electronic literature. Uh, and then finally, some thoughts on, on the future. Okay, then on to teaching. Um, uh, I wanna just go through really quickly four different ways that, that I have and do teach uh, electronic literature and, and think about it. Um, one is, uh, geez, I'm missing a closed parenthesis. 
Uh, one is part of a literary studies uh, curriculum, and we've heard a lot of people today who are, who are doing this um, and yesterday. Um, so you can teach it as a literature course in, say, English or Portuguese or a foreign language course or a comparative literature course. Uh, and some of these can be combined, obviously, or are combined. Uh, you can teach it as a creative writing course, specifically, um, where the main focus is on uh, creative media production, is on making stories and poetry in digital media. Uh, one of the things I've been doing a bit more recently is uh, say my graduate courses uh, in digital media aesthetics that are a little bit more critically uh, focused. We'll read books, but then we'll also bring in some of these objects and, and analyze them together. And I'll talk about how we do that. And then we teach a, a digital humanities course where our students work on research infrastructure and learn about the broader digital humanities um, while working with electronic literature. So these are the four courses that we currently teach at the University of Bergen where, um, that I was able to work electronic literature in <laughs> uh, over the course of my years there. Um, the, the first one is a course in digital genres. In this course, our students look at computer games, digital art, and electronic literature. Uh, all of these informed by, uh, by looking, uh, thinking about genre and comparing uh, the, the, the techniques and modalities, uh, modes of expression uh, in art, literature, and games together. So there's a module on electronic literature in there. Uh, we have a course called electronic literature where typically they'll look at uh, three genres of electronic literature and it'll be pretty much divided almost evenly in half um, uh, sort of history and, and critical approaches where I'm using this book now. Um, but then the other half is creative practice. And actually in the last few years I've moved towards their work, their final projects, are actually uh, creative projects. And it's been a, a good move uh, that the students really get a lot out of that, I think. Uh, then our digital humanities course and our uh, graduate seminar in digital media aesthetics, which changes topics um, each term. Okay, so I've been teaching for 17 years uh, uh, this sort of material. Um, and when I first started, uh, I was teaching in New Jersey, I got hired to start a new media studies track in a literature program. And I just, people mention a lot of barriers when you're talking about teaching electronic literature, so I thought I'd mention an interesting reversal that, I, that occurred. When I was teaching in a literature program, and this was 15 years ago, students would look at this and, uh, at ELIT and they'd say, how do I work this? It's like a complicated gizmo. What does this have to do with reading? Can't we just get novels and poetry? This is a literature class, man. So they were they were kind of hung up on, you know, how do I get, how do I traverse this thing to get to the story or to get to the poetry? Now, um, uh, our students are a little bit more diverse, but they have some technological training and they think a lot about uh, digital culture, but they'll say things like when they first encounter, this is an interesting interface, great use of JavaScript and CSS. Let me describe to you how this is working as a computer program. You want me to draw, draw a map and explain how it works for you, but why do you want me to read it? Um, I can get it without reading anything. Right? So I think now the, the trouble for me or the challenge, the, the trick for me is to get the students to actually uh, to read. It's, not, it's no longer explaining to them how to traverse uh, the textual machine. It's how to read. I'm going to go quickly through this because I want to get to the, uh, to the creative uh, part of it without, uh, without going over time. Um, but I want to just show you really quickly sort of uh, an example of how, uh, when I'm talking about these things and in this book, how we weave in uh, uh, literary tradition and technological tradition. So when I'm talking about combinatory poetics, I'll often start, uh, there, there are examples further back, but I'll often start with the Dada and Christian Zara's great um, instructions on how to make a Dada's poem, which is essentially to take a newspaper, uh, cut out the pieces, cut, cut, cut out words from the article, uh, put them into a paper bag, shake them gently, uh, dump them on the floor, uh, remove one word at a time, uh, and sort of arrange those words in the order that you get them into lines, and then copy conscientiously. And now the poem will be like you. You will have become an infinitely original writer with a charming sensitivity, although still misunderstood by the common people. 
Uh, and I do this, I start out uh, 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 the section on combinatorial poetics, I actually do this with students. The remarkable thing though is when you take a newspaper uh, from a contemporary time, from a given day, and you cut out uh, words from it and you rearrange them, something interesting happens in that because it has that, that shared context uh, and that shared moment in time, it performs an act of defamiliarization. Uh, and the, the poem is almost, uh, most of the time, uh, turns out to be, to read as interesting poetry. Um, so there's something, there's something to, uh, to this sort of, the, ca the characteristic of just aleatory poetics. Of course, the Surrealists uh, expanded on this. Uh, they were trying to access the logic of dreams and they did all sorts of different uh, collective uh, writing experiments or trying to write from the unconscious in different ways. One of the famous ones, of course, is The Exquisite Corpse, where either with text or writing, um, one person will write a line or start a drawing, fold it over, pass it to the next person, uh, pass it on until you've filled up a page, and then you'll end up with a poem um, that was written by everyone and written by no one, right? Um, and that involved elements of chance. <clears throat> And many of these, like for instance, there's a great collection of these at the Art Institute of Chicago, are actually quite remarkable um, in that they are these art objects that, you, that no one thought of um, but are, are nonetheless um, uh, fascinating. Uh, a more famous writer who used a similar method was uh, the novelist William S. Burroughs, um, where he would cut up both texts that he had written and audio tapes, and he would splice in uh, newspaper articles uh, and novels like Naked Lunch. Um, but when he was commenting on his, his friend and colleague uh, William Geisen's cut-up technique, he, he pointed out that um, the best writing almost always seems done by accident, but writers until the cut-up method was made e explicit um, had no way to produce the accident of spontaneity, that you couldn't just sit down and will spontaneity. But you can introduce unpredictable, spontaneous factors with a pair of scissors. A classic work, and this is one that I sort of imitated in the work that I was showing, the, the film that I was showing, of combinatory poetics, is Raymond Quineau's The Ulipin Poets, 100,000 Billion Poems. Um, this is a work uh, where it's uh, 10 to the 14th power of poem by virtue of the fact that Quineau wrote out uh, 10 uh, sonnets, but with lines flexible enough that they could interact with, uh, in, the, in the line places with any of the other uh, sonnets written there, and then cut the page into strips. So instead of 10 sonnets, you suddenly had uh, 100,000 uh, 100, billion sonnets. Uh, the Ulipo is very important, and the idea of constrained writing is very important for combinatory poetics. Um, Harry Matthews is, is a writer uh, who, who, was, who, who did, developed a bunch of interesting uh, constraints. And the Ulipo is a group of writers and mathematicians who get together in Paris for dinner once a month um, and deliver challenges to each other. Uh, there's some very famous ones uh, like George Perec's uh, Write a Novel Without Using the Letter E, um, which is uh, La Disparation um, in French. Um, but he, he makes this point that constraints have a creative effect in that we, we become so busy concentrating on the effect, this sort of object of desire to us, that if we find ourselves doing and saying things we never would have otherwise, uh, things that turn out to be exactly what we need to reach our goal. And I was sort of friends with Harry, and he told me the story of, of, uh, of where Perec came up with the idea for avoid uh, the novel without the letter E, which was that he, want, he really wanted to write about uh, his parents' disappearance during the Holocaust, but it was too, it was too close to him um, for him to be able to write effectively about it until he focused on this constraint of not using the letter E. And of course, um, I won't talk about all these, but, but computer programs are inherently constrained, right? Um, uh, that's essentially what you're doing when you're, when you're writing a computer program, is writing a sense of a set of constraints that the computer program will then perform. There's a whole tradition of performance scripts, uh, such as the, the Fluxus, 
Uh, one very simple, and this might sound like, oh, why would a, a literature professor cite these? Mad Libs um, are something that probably some of you are familiar with from your childhood, where you take, uh, you have a given text and you have a set of, of types of words that you can substitute in and out. Uh, many text generators, computer story generators, uh, work according to similar principles. Um, and that childish joy of discovery, I think, is something that's uh, familiar to many of us. I won't go into, into all of these examples, but there's also a really close connection with the generative music tradition. One wonderful thing I found out a few years ago that I didn't realize was that, for instance, David Bowie uh, used generative software to write uh, many of his lyrics. Um, so if anybody says like electronic literature uh, is never going to be a popular art form, uh, I, I give you David Bowie, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the history of this stretches back to technological uh, experimentation. Many of the people who wrote the first uh, generators weren't setting out to be digital poets. Uh, probably the first one by Christopher Strachey was the love letter generator. And if, if we look at a text like this saying, duck, duck, you are my little affection, my beautiful appetite, my eager hunger, my covetous love lusts for your infatuation, my yearning anxiously clings to your fellow feeling, Yours eagerly, M-U-C. Now, this doesn't seem like a, a really effective uh, love letter necessarily. It seems in many ways like a, a parody of a love letter. Um, interesting thing about Christopher Strachey is he was rumored to be a, a, a lover of Alan Turing, actually. He was, he was, uh, he was a gay man in, um, in the 1950s in the UK. Um, so there's a, a bit of theory around this piece that one of the things that he was doing was sort of uh, making fun of uh, courting traditions or heter heterosexual uh, conventions. Uh, and of course, MUC is actually the Manchester University computer um, that he offered. Uh, another work from the 1950s, uh, Stochastic Texts by Theo Lutz. Um, I can't really... Uh, I can't really read the, the German and I don't have the, oh, I lost the slide with the English. But one of the fascinating things about this, um, and I don't have the slide with the English, so only those of you who speak German will understand this. Um, but this was just to see if he could write a computer program that would generate aleatory texts. However, the poetry is actually kind of interesting. Um, one of the reasons for this is that he was, he was using titles from Kafka novels as the corpus of his text. Um, but you end up with some, uh, some really interesting texts as a result of uh, this very simple form of generation. Probably the first uh, poet explicitly to say, I want to set out and create a, something that generates poet is Alison Knowles, who worked with uh, the composer James Tenney, who had a, actually had a, a sort of uh, residency at Xerox uh, Labs in 1967 and said, hey, why don't we try to make something with this uh, computer? Um, uh, so they wrote the computer program, A House of Dust, um, that, uh, that generates very simple poems that describe a place, A House of Dust, um, uh, uh, To the Sea, um, and then it has another uh, element, Lighting, and then Inhabited by X. The fascinating thing about this is they use this as the basis for many other art projects, including, um, uh, in, including in addition to the poem, they built some installations. So they would generate these and then build architectural installations. They also did a poetry drop where they got a helicopter and they printed off about 10,000 pages of this poem and then uh, dropped it from the helicopter to a, a waiting um, audience, a fascinating, absurdist project. Um, probably not the first, I think Pe Pedro Barbosa would disagree, um, but the, uh, what was claimed to be the first book um, written by a computer, The Policeman's Beard is Half Constructed um, by Rachter, um, is a fascinating work. Uh, people didn't believe when this was published that it was actually generated by a computer program. They said, oh, you must have been, you must have been cheating. Um, it was a, a pretty good uh, program with a complex uh, uh, grammar, um, generative grammar. But it would produce poems like, Slowly I dream of flying, I observe turnpikes and streets studded with bushes. Coldly my soaring widens awareness. 
To guide myself determinedly, start to kill my pleasure during the time that hours and milliseconds pass away. Aid me in this. And soaring is formidable. Do not. And winging is unhinged. Um, they never revealed, although people have found bits of the code of, of Ractor enough to sort of prove that it, it was uh, that it was being generated. And there's different models of, of generation that I discuss in the book. Um, this was one of the more complex ones. But another interesting thing is I think what made this book so interesting was both the text, but then these fabulous collages that were done um, uh, by an artist that sort of tried to interpret the generative poetry. Uh, there's also uh, a tradition in story generation. Uh, in the first electronic literature collection, you'll find this very simple generator that I, I often use in class called Storyland. Um, that's fascinating that I think it generates the, the sort of the basic minimalist uh, elements of a story you could possibly uh, you, you could possibly put together and call a story. Um, and yet they, they actually read pretty well uh, for stories of about six lines long and demonstrate that you don't really need much, you don't really need much uh, to, to hang a plot on for people to interpret it as a story. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead here because I'm not, otherwise I'm not going to have time to get to the teaching. But I just want to point out that there's, um, there's many different ways that people are thinking of where does the art reside in a work of combinatory poetics. So for example, Nick Montfort has done a, a series of uh, obscurely famous um, generators called the PPG 256 series where he's taking an idea from computer programming, which is the idea of the elegant program, uh, the program that wastes no space, that has the minimalist use of code possible. Um, and then each of these are Perl programs that uh, generate poetry of a kind. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the, of the actual output. But the remarkable thing about this is, what can you do with just 256 letters to produce a program uh, that generates a kind of, of poetry that can be read by humans as poetry. Um, and I won't go through, through all of these. Uh, one of the pieces I did was a, 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 called the Frequency Poetry Generator. Um, this was, I wrote 2,000 constrained lines of a poem using only the 200 most used words in the English language. I wrote, uh, 10 lines beginning with, with each of these words. And then um, I wrote a program in Ruby where it essentially asks you what type of, of poem you'd like. Would you like a haiku? Would you like a, would you like a sonnet? Would you like a snowball? Um, uh, there's about 15 different types of poetry. And then the computer program assembles, selects from those 2,000 lines and delivers, you, uh, delivers a poem in that given form. The interesting thing is the, the traditional formal poems are almost always bad, if I try to do a sonnet or something like that with this. But I realized that because of the character counting capabilities, you could actually invent some new forms. So for example, uh, snowballs work well, but things like uh, two towers is, is, is one of these, where the computer program selects a number of characters to build one tower and another tower, and then creates this, uh, this kind of poem that you, that you read across. Um, yeah, and there's plenty more to say about that piece, but I won't. Uh, Evolution by Johannes Haldin's a fascinating work um, where they were trying to take the style of Johannes Haldin, and he said, what I'm trying to do is to make myself uh, irrelevant. Um, so we're going to create a computer program that uh, studies my work and mimics my style, and then I'll stop writing poetry. Um, so the, it, it, it doesn't exactly do that. Um, but they use, uh, but it's a very, it's a fascinating program. Then there's things like Pentametron, um, which is a bot that finds um, couplets. Uh, my profile looks exotic. Who agrees? I absolutely love Alicia Keys. Uh, can you imagine heading back in time? High, reven, high resolution picture of a line. Right. Or the similar Times haiku at the New York Times. Uh, which finds in, within the articles of, uh, within given text articles, it finds naturally occurring haiku uh, and then publishes them every once in a while. Um, so these are just accidental uh, haiku that a computer program recognizes. 
And then uh, Jave's recent work, uh, Big Data Poetry, uh, which I think is going to be a, a, a sort of highlighting a new trend um, where we can, have, we can sort of feed neural nets a corpus of texts. And then what Jave did was for, I think it was eight, six months or eight months, uh, every morning he woke up to a huge body of text produced by the computer and then spent the day editing these computer poems. So he was, he was writing, he was interacting with them. But then at the end of the day, he'd have, say, 10 new poems. And at the end of each month, he published a book of poetry uh, that was co-authored by him and by the machine. And I think this is a sort of really interesting reversal of roles here, um, where the human becomes the text editor. All right, on to teaching. Um, some core ideas that I use when I'm, when I'm uh, teaching ELIT one is I try to inform the writing by reading and knowledge of existing works and genres. I think not enough people who teach electronic literature as creative writing actually do this. Um, I think people sort of leap in and just say, okay, here's a tool, uh, make something with it, right? Whereas I, I think it, it's useful to step back and, and say, okay, what's been done before? Uh, let's get an, uh, an awareness of, the, of the, the area that we're working in. Uh, I also emphasize collaborative practice. Most of my work over many years has been uh, made with other people. I love to collaborate, and I think one of the great joys of the network and digital media is that it's really a social, can be a social practice of co-creation. Um, I try to allow students who are strong in particular areas, say a student's really good at writing and others are good at editing, somebody's a, a visual artist, a musician, some people are stronger at using code. Uh, and part of the reason why we do things in groups a lot is to say, all right, well, you focus on that. Use your particular talents. Um, I try to emphasize um, ideas, stories, poetics over techniques. In other words, I'm not teaching a course in a given software platform. Um, I'm not teaching people to use Photoshop or C++, Python. CSS, et cetera. Um, I'll try to support that and, and send them places and give them opportunities to learn these things. But what I want the students to focus on is what they're making and how to, and think about from a scalable model of how they can uh, tell a story. Um, so we try to also spend quite a bit of the time looking at the work that they're doing and talking about it together. Uh, sharing it, not creating a one, you know, just professor to student, but as a group. And then I always, uh, you know, I'm not trying to create a professional class of elite writers. Uh, it would be virtually impossible to do so um, because very few people actually get paid to be elite writers, right? So I'm always trying to think what are they going to learn as a result of doing this? Digital literacy, things like project management. Um, things uh, like how to encounter digital media as a creative space rather than one that you're just sort of fed content from, right? Um, because most of my students will go on and do other things, and that's certainly the case in our, in our digital um, culture program. We're not trying to get people published in the New Yorker. So really quickly, four examples of assignments that I do. Uh, the first one is to hack a gorge. Uh, the second one is to work with interactive narrative and twine. Uh, another one is to, to create a locative narrative. Uh, and the third is to perform a net prop. So the story behind uh, Chiroko Gorge and uh, Tokyo Garage, uh, Nick Montford, a close friend of mine, created a poetry generator about, that's a nature poetry generator called Chiroko Gorge um, about a national park in ta Taiwan. Um, that I really liked because this sort of inversion, I'm going to create a, this sort of machine-based form that creates a poem about waterfalls and uh, gently flows over time and continues generating this. Um, and I love the elegance of the code. When I looked at uh, the code that, that Nick had written, as always, very tight, minimalistic code. And I looked at the language and I said, geez, that's not very much language. Um, what if I decided to improve it? Um, so what I did, as sort of a joke for Nick, um, primarily to amuse an audience of one, was I took Nick's Taroko Gorge and uh, changed all of the vocabulary 
uh, changed uh, some very basic elements of the way the poem displays on the page and the speed at which it displays. Uh, retitled it uh, Tokyo Garage and then uh, crossed out Nick's name and put mine under it and then published it on the internet. Um, and then I sent an email to Nick saying, uh, Nick, uh, look what I did, I improved your poem. Um, and he loved that. Uh, so, so what I did is I took his minimalist vocabulary and then made it very much maximalist, right? And I took an idea of a poem about uh, nature and I turned it into a, a poem about, about cities and cosmopolitanism um, and a, 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 about Tokyo uh, or an idea of Tokyo. The interesting thing that happened after this was I published this, then Nick wrote a blog post about it. Uh, a few weeks later, J.R. Carpenter wrote, uh, did the same thing, except that she wrote hers called Gorge. So this became a poem about eating and, and gorging yourself. Uh, someone else then a few weeks later wrote Taike George about the, uh, the Star Trek hero. Um, someone, someone else wrote one about, uh, about the Beatles, uh, Yoko and Gorge, a sort of pornographic poem about the Beatles and John and Yoko in bed. Um, and then this kept going and going and going. And before we knew it, um, I think about 30 different authors had done this, and it became, it became its own genre in a way, right? Uh, this very simple uh, computer program that spawned all these other versions. So I do that as a, an assignment with my class now, and it's a great assignment. Um, and they all do something different with it. It's a very kind of low entry uh, assignment. Um, they can, if they're, if they're good at imagery, if they're good at language, if they're good at coding, they can expand upon this code base in, in different ways. Um, and they all come with their own, their own version of the poem. So a great thing about this assignment, anyone who can work with words can do it. It exposes students to code uh, without demanding immediate background knowledge of programming. It, it really effectively demonstrates the poetic power of recombination. Uh, it can scale up and down for different skill levels. And it shows, and this is something I emphasize in the book, uh, that writing, coding, and playing are very related. Um, all, all these things are, coding is a form of writing. Writing is a form of play. Uh, Twine, we've heard a bit about today. Uh, it's a great platform. I won't, uh, I won't talk too much about it. Jose Diaz gave an excellent talk on teaching with Twine. Wonderful thing about Twine, though, an open source software uh, platform that there was an early uh, piece of hypertext software called StorySpace uh, that was pre-web, was very proprietary, but had some great features that you didn't actually have if you were just authoring HTML uh, in the web. Chris Klimas said, I like these features. I'm going to create uh, an open source software um, that integrates the best features of StorySpace um, or similar features, and such as like visual mapping um, of text. And I'm also going to be thinking about this as not only a hypertext writing system, but also as an interactive fiction writing system. I've just started using this in the last couple of years. Uh, my students have leapt into it. Um, it's an immediate writing environment uh, that, they, uh, that they encounter, and whether they think they're writers or not when they start, um, they really discover, as you said, they discover a voice somehow. Um, and it's, a, it's very conducive um, to, to writing. So uh, my students came up with some really brilliant projects uh, doing all sorts of different things. There was a murder mystery on a train, there were different sorts of uh, children's fictions, there were, uh, there were mythological tales. Uh, a lot of my students are international, I told them they could write in French if they want. I, I can speak French, not Portuguese, unfortunately, <laughs> or I can read French. Uh, and Norwegian, even like this student, uh, was someone who wanted to work with educational technology. So he wrote, uh, he wrote a story that it was a, a basic story, a children's story, but it also was like teaching math and basic reading and some of the, he was kind of trying to map it onto some Norwegian education uh, objectives. Um, so it was just remarkable uh, the kinds of things they came up with. So great thing about Twine, uh, very, again, low learning curve. You don't need a lot to get into it, but it's highly extensible. So you, if you have programming knowledge, you can build upon that. It integrates the best features of that early software and elements of interactive fiction software um, and exposes students to those conventions. So they read the chapters on hypertext interactive fiction. 
that have some background, and then they leap into Twine. Uh, it's immediately interactive. Uh, it, you can embed images and sounds, so there's multimedia. Uh, it's immediately publishable, shareable, and there's this large, young, enthusiastic user community. Um, so students have questions about some technical aspect of Twine, I just say, you know, go to the Twine community, and they find people who, who respond to them and support them. Uh, another sort of assignment, again, I won't go into too much, but this is uh, one we did when Mark Marino was a visiting researcher with us, uh, and I've done a number of these different sort of uh, locative narratives, and these can be very simple technologically, right? The thing I like about them is I say, okay, we've been spending all this time in front of the screen. Take a notebook, take a pen, go out in the city, and I want you to write a fragment of a story set in a particular space, right? And then we can use technology to map these things together. One really simple way we did with this project was like Google Maps, right? We could also use like QR codes and stickers where you, you, know, you take your phone out and you see a QR code on a public space and you get delivered a chunk of story. You could use AR to do this, right? Um, but building stories together in a physical space and sort of getting that idea that electronic literature doesn't need to mean, you know, I'm just diving into the screen, but it can mean we're getting out into the world and telling stories in new ways. Um, yeah, so uh, there's concrete sets of constraints. You need to work in a physical environment, you get to think beyond the screen, um, and it's ideal in a way for teams of people to do this. The other sort of, I'm sorry, did you want to, were you taking a picture? <laughs> uh, the other, the other uh, great form that, that we use a lot, and I do, uh, again, with uh, Mark Marino and Rob Wittig, do this every semester. They have net probs where they encourage people from universities all over the world uh, to join in and just writers to join in. I, I play along with these a lot. Um, we, you can, of course, generate your own, but the idea is network-based improvisational writing in everyday platforms. So saying, all right, what if we decide we're going to do uh, the most common one that they use is Twitter, right? Um, or Facebook or Instagram or Periscope or any of these sorts of TikTok, any of these kinds of platforms that, that people and especially young people are using every day. Um, but let's come up, with, let's have a premise that we start with. So for instance, the one we did with my students last term and with some of their students was behind your back. Um, so the idea of this was uh, that, okay, the, the social media platform you use every day suddenly logs you out and you can't, uh, you can't log into it, but you keep getting notifications uh, and people are commenting on you, but you can't see the comments. So you don't know exactly what's going on. So this was sort of the premise, right? Um, and then we, we generated characters. I made a little character generator, and each, each character, each student hit a button and got a piece of paper with a, a character that had a, a certain background and certain concerns, uh, certain things they were worrying about. And then we all jumped into the, to the Twitter flow, use a hashtag, and all of a sudden we're joining this story that's being collaboratively developed by sometimes, you know, 50, 100 people, right? Uh, and net probs is a, a separate topic. They're sort of steered in various ways and that plot elements will be introduced by the people directing them. Uh, but if you haven't tried them, both for your students and just for yourself, I would say, uh, it's, uh, it's great fun and, and a great example of collective writing, which is something I also um, write about in the book. Um, so we're running, uh, we're running pretty close to out of time now. Um, but uh, uh, some different things about this assignment that I think are useful. We're considering the constraints, effects, and uses of social media. This also allows us to look at this from a critical standpoint. Often, often the themes are critical of our everyday practices on the internet. There's a kind of role playing happening. It's responsive, something that's really rewarding for, for students, I think, is that they're not just getting feedback from Professor Rettberg or whoever, but other people are writing back to them and playing along with them. Um, it complicates this idea of, of digital genre and then it's like, is it writing? Is it a performance? Is it a play? Is it, is it a novel? Is it just Twitter? What does it mean? Um, and then it, it gives us a sort of environment of reflective critique. 
Um, the sorts of things that I do in our digital media aesthetic course, uh, I'll often take a given uh, theme that we'll think about. For example, the relationship between environmental studies and, and the digital humanities. And then we might read books, for instance, like UC Parika's kind of critique of uh, uh, the effects of computation on the geology of our planet, or uh, Lisa Swanstrom's Animal, Vegetable, Digital, or Soren Pold's uh, The Meta Interface. Um, and these are works that, uh, that are theoretical and deal with themes, but also often deal with, with digital artworks. Um, and I might use the ones that are discussed in those books or bring in new ones and say, all right, let's look at this theoretical framework and then let's look at these art artifacts and think about how we write about these within that frame. Right? Or, um, or, for instance, if we were going to be, uh, if we we're going to look at social media and, and large uh, internet companies from a critical standpoint, we might look at one of Roberto's books or the Googleization of Everything, or the novel The Circle by Dave Eggers, uh, and then look at projects like the um, uh, American Psycho project that was discussed during uh, Roberto's keynote, or um, John Cayley's How It Is in Common Tongues, which, was, uh, which is actually virtually identical to the text of Samuel Beckett's How It Is, except that all of the phrases and algorithms searched for and found all of the phrases in the book uh, on Google searches and then <coughs> cites those individually, uh, thus demonstrating both the sort of absurdity of the copyright regime uh, and also how Google encloses and in a sense owns uh, language. Or Ad Nauseam uh, by Daniel Howe, which is a, a plugin that clicks on every ad on a given page. Uh, and then delivers those images uh, back to you, creating a, a profile for you of who uh, Facebook and the advertisers think you are. Or the NetProv, um, I work for the web, uh, which was a, a project where all the characters realized that they were spending most of their time uh, clicking and liking things and putting a lot of labor into this. And suddenly there was an uprising of the common web content producers uh, who decided to go on strike with the Webley's uh, union um, to protest their, their treatment. And then finally, and this is something that I know is done, uh, at least I know that Rui does uh, similar th things with some of his students, there's a lot of technological infrastructure involved in electronic literature. We host one of the, um, uh, one of the largest database, open access research databases on electronic literature at the University of Bergen. Uh, the Elm SIP Electronic Literature Knowledge Base, which if you haven't checked out, I encourage you to use and to contribute to. But we have a course where we're studying the digital humanities broadly, but then students work very specifically with our database, both developing it and learning from it. So they're contributing to the large-scale documentation of the field. Uh, they're learning about uh, theory, debates, context of digital humanities. They're getting kind of very specific research training in databases and archives. Uh, and then what they do is they develop individual research uh, collections, which are sort of mini databases within the database uh, that are based on research questions. Uh, then we teach them how to do some data mining and visualization uh, using the database. So a few examples of the types of research collections, and these weren't all done by students. I threw this one in for Luciana, unfortunately she's not here, but she developed a, a research collection when she was a postdoc with us on Brazilian electronic literature. Um, I think the, the video is not linked right now, but there's a great interview with Manuel and Rui in the, uh, done by Alvaro Seixa that's part of the Portuguese uh, uh, electronic literature collection. So these are things that are in the wider database, but then they're a kind of focused set of things but also things that are thematic, like uh, Hannah Ackerman is one of our current PhD students is doing one that's specifically on interventions of digital texts and physical spaces. And then for their final projects, what the students will do is develop a specific research question. Like there was a philosophy student who took the course who was saying, I'm really interested in uh, Wittgenstein's concept of language games, um, and what I'd like to do is go through the database and uh, map 
uh, given works uh, using vocabulary from, from Wittgenstein, uh, and then visualize to see how, uh, how these Wittgenstein's terms might apply uh, to ludic uh, works on the web. Um, so these are, uh, I'm, I'm wrapping up now, but those are sort of four, uh, four, different, um, four different approaches, each different types of courses, right? So it's so one of the things I want to emphasize and emphasize in the book that there's not like, there's not a cookie cutter, a way of teaching electronic literature, but in fact, this body of material is rich in many different types of teaching contexts. Um, yeah. So, and I haven't mentioned much the primary and secondary context, but some recommendations I would have in addition to universities, if you're teaching uh, primary or secondary, consider, you know, uh, invite authors and digital artists in the schools just to expose students to work. Um, make workshops where, where students get engaged in the creation in digital media. Um, there's a whole subset of work that we did a project called Kitty Lit, and I know there's one happening in, in Portugal now as well uh, that, that Rui mentioned, um, and there's been similar projects in, in France and other places. But we, we did a series of exhibitions across the Nordic countries of just really innovative interactive ebooks and other uh, types of digital literature made specifically for children. Um, and that's, that's beginning to develop as a field within children's literature as well. Um, again, think about all these different, and then think about all these different contexts, digital literacy, art, children's literature, English and foreign language, uh, where this work can be material, uh, materially useful. Okay, just to conclude, for those of you, most of you are familiar now with the field, but uh, there's a bunch of electronic literature out there available for free. Um, the electronic literature collections published by the electronic literature organization are a great place to start. Uh, there have been three volumes now, each with more than, I think, 50 works. The last one was uh, immense. Uh, they went crazy, the number of, of works that they published. But to get a sense of the diversity uh, of approaches that, writing, that writers are taking, uh, this is a great place to go. When we had when the Elmsted project, 2010 to 2013, we put out the first specifically trans-European um, uh, collection that included a number of, of works in many different languages. Of course, the electronic literature knowledge base. And by the way, I hope that all of you who presented at this conference will, uh, if you don't have an account, ask for an account in the database and create a record of your presentation and of your uh, creative and critical work and finally, a bonus uh, that goes along with this book that's uh, available for free. Um, I worked with a graduate student, and for every, every chapter of this book, we created a, a separate research collection within the knowledge base uh, that has links to all of the uh, documentation of all of the creative works, all of the critical writing referenced, all of the authors that were referenced, uh, in those individual chapters. So if anyone's thinking about teaching this book, um, that's a great additional supplement uh, to use when you're teaching that. So I know I, I, know I threw a lot at you uh, very fast, um, but I hope that this presentation was useful. So thanks, Tuzen Tak, muito obrigado.